49. The Bedwarfing Virtue When we last left our hero, he was on a ship, taking him away from the Happy Isles. Let's continue with the story. 1. When Zarathustra was again on the continent, he did not go straightway to his mountain and his cave, but made many wanderings and questionings, and ascertained this and that, so that he said of himself jestingly, Lo, a river that floweth back unto its source in many windings, for he wanted to learn what had taken place among men during the interval, whether they had become greater or smaller. We learn that Zarathustra is back on land and is homeward bound, that is, back to his cave, his place of contemplation. This is apparently where he is going to deal with the abysmal thought that is gnawing at the margins of his consciousness. Before that, however, he wants to find out what has been going on with humanity during the time he spent in the Happy Isles. Have things gone better or worse? Or, to use his terms, have men become greater or smaller? And once, when he saw a row of new houses, he marveled and said, What do these houses mean? Verily no great soul put them up as its simile. Did perhaps a silly child take them out of its toy box? Would that another child put them again into the box? And these rooms and chambers, can men go out and in there? They seem to be made for silk dolls, or for dainty eaters, who perhaps let others eat with them. Definitely smaller. In the modern age, population started to grow rapidly. It brought changes to the way things always were with phenomena like urbanization and mass culture. Zarathustra sees a row of houses that have all been built in the same manner, without individuality, and it dramatizes this process in which modern man becomes just part of a mass. It makes these houses look small in his eyes, and the same goes for their inhabitants. And Zarathustra stood still and meditated. At last he said sorrowfully, There hath everything become smaller. Everywhere do I see lower doorways. He who is of my type can still go there through, but he must stoop. Or when shall I arrive again at my home, where I shall no longer have to stoop, shall no longer have to stoop before the small ones? And Zarathustra sighed and gazed into the distance. The same day, however, he gave his discourse on the bedwarfing virtue. The answer, then, is that humans have grown smaller, despite his efforts. Almost all of them have been swallowed up by the herd, downsized to its level. Remember, Zarathustra has some respect for the herds of the past, those tribes where everyone was driven by the same set of values. But the modern herd is a construction formed by the modern state, and is nothing but an amalgamation of many different sets of values. The result, inevitably, is the bedwarfing of the human spirit. He can still connect to them, but he feels like he needs to stoop to their spiritual level, and it depresses him. This inspires another speech. 2. I pass through this people and keep mine eyes open. They do not forgive me for not envying their virtues. They bite at me, because I say unto them that for small people small virtues are necessary, and because it is hard for me to understand that small people are necessary. Zarathustra is disliked by these modern humans. They believe themselves to be virtuous people, better than the people of the past. They don't like to hear him say that they have just gone smaller, and that their morality is a morality for small people who cannot achieve true greatness. And they are even more perturbed by his assertion that they should change into something else, something greater. Here am I still like a cock in a strange farmyard, at which even the hens peck, but on that account I am not unfriendly to the hens. I am courteous towards them, as towards all small annoyances. To be prickly towards what is small seemeth to me wisdom for hedgehogs. He feels among them like a giant among dwarfs. They do not bother him with their petty attacks, and he has no time to waste on them. They all speak of me when they sit around their fire in the evening. They speak of me, but no one thinketh of me. This is the new stillness which I have experienced. 
Their noise around me spreadeth a mantle over my thoughts. Even though he has become a household name, Zarathustra realizes that they are not listening to him, not trying to understand his thoughts. He actually finds something good about it. It gives him protection and allows him to say whatever he wants and develop his subversive thoughts without fear of repercussion. They shout to one another, What is this gloomy cloud about to do to us? Let us see that it doth not bring a plague upon us. And recently did a woman seize upon her child that was coming unto me. Take the children away, cried she. Such eyes scorch children's souls. They are, of course, afraid of him. Society is always fearful of thinkers who have new thoughts. And they use the same accusation against him that has always been leveled against subversive thinkers, that he is corrupting the youth. They cough when I speak. They think coughing an objection to strong winds. They divine nothing of the boisterousness of my happiness. We have not yet time for Zarathustra, so they object. But what matter about a time that hath no time for Zarathustra? They pretend to ignore him, thinking it will make him go away. But he knows that he is happier than them, stronger than them, so their behavior does not deter him. He keeps on delivering his message. And if they should altogether praise me, how could I go to sleep on their praise? A girdle of spines is their praise unto me. It scratcheth me even when I take it off. And this also did I learn among them. The praiser doeth as if he gave back. In truth, however, he wanteth more to be given him. Ask my foot if their lording and luring strains please it, Verily to such measure and tick-tack it liketh neither to dance nor to stand still. To small virtues would they fain lure and lord me, to the tick-tack of small happiness would they fain persuade my foot. Sometimes they try another tactic, and praise him for his wisdom. But he knows that it is just flattery, aimed to lure him to become one of them. He is not tempted, because they have nothing to offer him. I pass through this people and keep mine eyes open. They have become smaller, and ever become smaller. The reason thereof is their doctrine of happiness and virtue. For they are moderate also in virtue, because they want comfort. With comfort, however, moderate virtue only is compatible. He now starts to explain why humans have become smaller. It is because of the doctrine of happiness. They are not looking for enormous ecstatic joys, as he does, but equate happiness with comfort. Thus, instead of cultivating their virtues to become great, they keep their virtues moderate. To be sure, they also learn in their way to stride on and stride forward. That I call their hobbling. Thereby they become a hindrance to all who are in haste, and many of them go forward and look backwards thereby with stiffened necks. Those do I like to run up against. Zarathustra speaks the language of progress here. Modern man believes that he is progressing towards the ideal society. Zarathustra agrees that humans should progress, but he has a much more ambitious target, the Superman. It seems that he thinks that humans are actually progressing towards this target but they are moving much too slow for him, hobbling along and standing in his way. The metaphor about those who look backwards probably signifies those who are more conservative and believe you have to build on the past in order to progress, whereas he believes that you have to slay the past. Again, we see that he is teetering between two positions, one that wants to create an ideal future in the Superman and thus believes in progress and another that wants to forget about the future and focus on the present, and thus believes in being an endless wanderer. Foot and I shall not lie, nor give the lie to each other, but there is much lying among small people. Some of them will, but most of them are willed. Some of them are genuine, but most of them are bad actors. There are actors without knowing it amongst them, and actors without intending it, the genuine ones are always rare, especially the genuine actors. Only a select few are driven by their own will to power. The others are just conforming to the norms, 
acting in the way they are expected to act. It is so common that they don't even realize that they are acting. Of man there is little here, therefore do their women masculinize themselves, for only he who is man enough will save the woman in woman. Zarathustra repeats his position that men and women have a different nature, and should live according to their nature in order to be happy. But when men don't behave in a masculine way, the women are losing their femininity as well, as they have to fulfill the role of men. And this hypocrisy found I worst amongst them, that even those who command feign the virtues of those who serve. I serve, thou servest, we serve, so chanteth here even the hypocrisy of the rulers, and alas, if the first lord be only the first servant. We realize that everything he said until now pertains to modern liberal democracy, and its ills. The greatest ill, he says, is the hypocrisy of pretending that you don't want power. Even those who are in power pretend that they only serve the people. Ah, even upon their hypocrisy did mine eyes' curiosity alight, and well did I divine all their fly happiness and their buzzing around sunny window panes. So much kindness, so much weakness do I see, so much justice and pity, so much weakness. Round, fair, and considerate are they to one another, as grains of sand are round, fair, and considerate to grains of sand. Kindness, justice, and pity are all considered virtues by these people, and they pride themselves on having them. But we are all driven by will to power, and these so-called virtues are only make-believe. In his book Dawn of Day, Nietzsche already discussed how these so-called virtues are actually ways in which humans exert their power on each other. The result of this hypocrisy is the weakening of the human spirit, and subsequently the human body. Modestly to embrace a small happiness, that do they call submission, and at the same time they peer modestly after a new small happiness. Another form of hypocrisy is what they call submission, as they pretend to dedicate themselves to something. But they never do it wholeheartedly. They do it in a moderate fashion, never submitting to it completely, and already think of the next thing they are going to allegedly submit to. In their hearts they want simply one thing most of all, that no one hurt them. Thus do they anticipate everyone's wishes and do well unto everyone. That, however, is cowardice, though it be called virtue. And another so-called virtue is their charity to each other. But what's behind it is actually cowardice, the fear of being hurt. And when they chance to speak harshly, those small people... Then do I hear therein only their hoarseness. Every draught of air maketh them hoarse. Shrewd indeed are they. Their virtues have shrewd fingers. But they lack fists. Their fingers do not know how to creep behind fists. Virtue for them is what maketh modest and tame. Therewith have they made the wolf a dog, and man himself man's best domestic animal. All of this makes them weak in spirits. Instead of showing pride and strength as they pursue their goals, they act with cunningness and hypocrisy, hiding their true intentions. Compared to what they could be, they are but dwarfs. We set our chair in the midst, so saith their smirking unto me, and as far from dying gladiators as from satisfied swine. That, however, is mediocrity, though it be called moderation. In short, what they call moderation, the golden mean, is actually nothing but mediocrity. 3. I pass through this people and let fall many words, but they know neither how to take nor how to retain them. They wonder why I came not to revile venery and vice, and verily I came not to warn against pickpockets either. They wonder why I am not ready to abet and whet their wisdom, as if they had not yet enough of wiseacres, whose voices grate on mine ear like slate pencils. After he talked about the small humans and their pathetic little virtues, he now turns to talk about his place among them. 
they expect him to behave like most intellectuals, that is, to use his wisdom to enrich their lives with little witticisms, or with constructive criticism. That they can appreciate, but he refuses to play this role. And when I call out, curse all the cowardly devils in you that would fain whimper and fold their hands and adore, then do they shout, Zarathustra is godless. And especially do their teachers of submission shout this, but precisely in their ears do I love to cry, Yea, I am Zarathustra the godless. Those teachers of submission, wherever there is aught puny or sickly or scabby, there do they creep like lice, and only my disgust preventeth me from cracking them. His detractors accuse him of being godless, thinking that this accusation will destroy him. But he accepts it with pride. Their religion made them into these small and submissive creatures, and he wants to liberate them from it. The drive behind Nietzsche's atheism was his moral outrage, his feeling that religion is turning humans wicked. Well, this is my sermon for their ears. I am Zarathustra the godless who saith, Who is more godless than I that I may enjoy his teaching? I am Zarathustra the godless, where do I find mine equal? And all those are mine equals who give unto themselves their will, and divest themselves of all submission. I am Zarathustra the godless, I cook every chance in my pot, and only when it hath been quite cooked do I welcome it as my food. He now begins to relay his alternative to religion. His attack is specifically on Christianity, which he accuses of turning its believers into submissive and weak creatures. Instead, he wants them to act according to their will to power, and not submit to any external law. The will to power, he says, overcomes even what chance throws your way, as, whatever it is, you take it and reshape it with your will, or cook it in your pot, as he says here, turning it into a source of pleasure and happiness. And verily many a chance came imperiously unto me, but still more imperiously did my will speak unto it, then did it lie imploringly upon its knees imploring that it might find home and heart with me, and saying flatteringly, See, O Zarathustra, how friend only cometh unto friend. When you overcome what chance throws you away, that thing then becomes your tamed beast. When you experience it again, you enjoy it. But why talk I, when no one hath mine ears, and so will I shout it out unto all the winds? Ye ever become smaller, ye small people, ye crumble away, ye comfortable ones, ye will yet perish. By your many small virtues, by your many small omissions, and by your many small submissions. Zarathustra suddenly remembers that none of these people can understand what he said about the will to power and about chance, so he switches to just scolding them, and telling them that their days are numbered. Their weakness shall be their downfall. Too tender, too yielding, so is your soil. But for a tree to become great, it seeketh to twine hard roots around hard rocks. Also, what ye omit weaveth at the web of all the human future. Even your naught is a cobweb, and a spider that liveth on the blood of the future. The problem is, they are also destroying the future of humanity. No great man can grow in such weak soil, as his spirit finds nothing to fight against, nothing that would make it stronger. And when ye take, then is it like stealing, ye small virtuous ones. But even among knaves, honour saith that one shall only steal when one cannot rob. It giveth itself. That is also a doctrine of submission. But I say unto you, ye comfortable ones, that it taketh to itself and will ever take more and more from you. They pretend to be giving of themselves to others, but Zarathustra warns you that with that, they are actually taking from you. This morality is robbing us of our powers. Ah, that ye would renounce all half-willing, and would decide for idleness as ye decide for action. Ah, that ye understood my word. 
Do ever what ye will, but first be such as can will. Since they are not connected to their will to power, they cannot will in a healthy way. Their will isn't pure. Zarathustra preaches that we should become people who can will in a pure way, and then we shall will great things. Once this happens, man will be free to do as he wills, knowing that his will naturally directs him towards healthy things. Love ever your neighbors as yourselves, but first be such as love themselves. Such as love with great love, such as love with great contempt, thus speaketh Zarathustra the godless. Love your neighbor as yourself is a well-known Judeo-Christian dictum, but it can only work if you first of all love yourself. By focusing on neighbor love, these people neglected self-love, and so the entire dictum falls apart. Instead, Zarathustra preaches that you should first learn to love yourself, and this self-love also contains self-contempt, contempt what you are now, in order to want to surpass yourself and become greater. But why talk I when no one hath mine ears? It is still an hour too early for me here. Mine own forerunner am I among this people, mine own cock-crow in dark lanes. Once again, Zarathustra realizes that he began to preach to ears that are not ready for him yet. By leaving his disciples behind, he lost the crowd that could understand what he is saying. He can't help but preach, but then he catches himself and realizes the futility of this action when dwelling among this crowd. But their hour cometh. And there cometh also mine. Hourly do they become smaller, poorer, unfruitfuller, poor herbs, poor earth. And soon shall they stand before me like dry grass and prairie, and verily weary of themselves, and panting for fire more than for water. So Arthusa consoles himself that this cannot go on forever. Eventually, the small people will render themselves extinct, or rather, they will become so weak that he will be able to conquer them with his power. Then will come the time for his ideas to win. O blessed hour of the lightning, O mystery before noontide! Running fires will I one day make of them, and heralds with flaming tongues. Herald shall they one day with flaming tongues. It cometh, it is nigh, the great noontide. Thus spake Zarathustra. That hour, the hour when they become so weak that his ideas will start to win, is what he calls the great noontide, the moment when the shrinking of humanity will be reversed and it will start growing again. This hour, he prophesizes, is nigh.